off. And another reminder as to why you don't want to share anything personal, because this will be recorded and shared for any students who weren't able to attend today's session. OK, so now that that is all out of the way, let's move forward. I recognize that we have a number of folks in this session who are in various stages of the application process. So some of you might still be waiting for a decision and have questions about how long it'll take, and where to find your decision. So as you can imagine, it's a very busy time in the admissions office. So right now we're predicting four to six weeks for a student to receive a decision on their application. Now that timeline starts from when your application was complete, not the time that you started or submitted your application initially. If you feel like it's been longer than six weeks and you are sure that your application is complete and you've uploaded all of the documents we've asked for, then feel free to reach out. We're happy to do some investigation. But it is really important that you make sure your application is in fact complete. So you can do this by logging into your Carleton 360 account and make sure that you've uploaded all of the documents in your checklist that we have asked for. So it never hurts to double check or triple check that your application is complete. So now let's transition to what that offer would look like or where you'll find it. Let's start there. So again, logging into your Carleton 360 account, that's where all of the updates will be held. Um, if there is any updates, like we're asking for a new document or a decision has been made, you will receive an email indicating that you should go check your Carleton 360 account. On the left hand side in your account, you will see applications. So select that. Then you'll be able to select your submitted applications. So find your submitted application. And if a decision has been made, you can view it there in your Carleton 360. And if you've received an offer of admission, that is the time to celebrate. Hopefully you have your own pack of confetti at home to help celebrate. Your offer package that you will receive in Carleton 360 has lots of great information, important information. So we suggest that you read all of the documents carefully. And when you're done, read them again. You can expect to see in this package your offer of admission, which will detail the program that you've been admitted to and other important details like when you have to accept your offer of admission, um, the conditions attached to that offer. So if you need to maintain a certain GPA upon graduation, so read that really carefully. If you received an entrance scholarship, that will be indicated in your letter as well. And third, if you're eligible for a guarantee of residence, meaning you are coming into first year directly from high school, your offer of residence will be outlined in your offer package as well. Something else you might see if you are eligible for advanced standing in your courses because you completed the International Baccalaureate, French Baccalaureate, A levels, um, AP, then your package will include an audit, which will indicate the courses that you've been granted credit for. So watch for that as well. There are a few action items that you must take upon receiving your offer of admission. So number one is you have to accept your offer. There's no fee attached to accepting your offer of admission. And there will be a very specific date included that you must do this by. For most of you, that'll be May 1st, but that date otherwise might be three weeks from when your offer was, was awarded. So just be attentive to what that date is. If you have applied through OUAC, you will accept your offer through the OUAC website. If you apply directly through Carleton, then you'll accept your offer through Carleton 360. So that's the first main action item, accept your offer of admission by the date indicated. Second, 
if you are offered a spot in residence, you have to actively accept your place. You have until June 8th to accept and pay your deposit of $700. So you'll do that through the housing website, which you can see here on the slide, housing at carlton.ca. That website also has a lot of great information about living in residence, the process of filling out the additional paperwork. So please do spend some time on their website. And if you weren't guaranteed a spot because you weren't eligible, you can still apply for residence after you've accepted your offer of admission from Carleton through this website as well. So let's just do a bit of a, of a review because I know that this has been a lot of information. So number one, make sure that you are checking your email regularly and your Carlton 360 account. This is where all and any important updates will be sent. Once you receive your offer of admission and are done celebrating, make sure you read it carefully for every detail. In May, don't forget to accept your offer by May 1st, so any time from when you get your offer of admission to that deadline of May 1st or the date indicated on your letter. With before June 8th, accept your place in residence and pay the deposit. And we haven't talked about registering for classes yet because it is a uh, little far off, but this will happen in July. You will also get important updates about registration through email. So even once you've accepted your offer, it's important to continue to check your emails. I can't say it enough. And by August 25th is when you have to pay your first term tuition fees. So this is also the time that you can start the I Start Orientation Program. This is an online course intended for international students to help them prepare for the transition of living in Canada and becoming an active member of the Carleton and Ottawa community. So definitely uh, take part in that I Start orientation as well. Okay, so I think this is a really good time to pause and answer some questions. So I'm gonna just stop screen sharing here for one second or for a few seconds. And I'd like now to invite questions that are more related to what we've talked about so far in terms of your application and the process of accepting your offer of admission. So we'll take a few questions around that subject before I transition to talking about study permits. So Emily, there she is. She's gonna feed me your questions from the chat and I will do my best to answer them orally. And if we need to, we'll follow up with some helpful links as well. So Emily, I'm ready for you. Okay, awesome. So I just typed into the chat uh, for folks to put their questions in and I can see some people typing, um, but we don't have anything yet, just yet. So I anticipate having a couple questions uh, in a minute or two, um, but we'll just wait for them to come in. Okay, no problem. Oh, okay, anticipation. We, Here we go. We first have question. our first one now. Awesome. Okay, so our first question is, how do you get credits from your A-levels if you haven't written your exams yet? Yeah, good question. So this can happen in a couple of different ways. So sometimes, and it depends on how you were admitted, students are admitted on predicted grades or their interim grades. So in those cases, we can give provisional advanced standing for your A-levels. So that might be the case for you. If you see that you don't receive advanced standing in that audit attached to your um, offer package, then it likely will happen kind of retroactively once we get your final results. So I know Emily's been in the admissions game a little bit longer than I have. Anything to add, Emily? I think you covered it perfectly. Yeah, for for the provisional credit, we will basically uh, make it final. So you'll have that credit once we do receive your final uh, grades and we can see that you actually, in fact, were able to achieve the minimum grade. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Next question. Uh, uh, 
if I have a condition in my offer letter, when do I have to complete it? And I, I think they mean when do they have to meet the conditions? Right. Perfect. So yeah, a couple of things about your conditional offer that I want to clarify. So many of you are in progress. Maybe you're in the middle of your grade 12 year, for example. So with a conditional offer, you can essentially move forward in many ways as if you are fully admitted. So you're still able to apply for your study permit. In July, you'll be able to register for classes. Um, moving forward again as if you are fully admitted. The condition that most of you have on your offer are final grades. So the main requirement for that is that you submit a final and official transcript as soon as it's available. So we don't have a hard deadline on that because it differs by country, by curriculum. So as soon as it is available, you'll want to make sure that it is submitted to Carleton. Awesome. Thank you, Jess. Uh, sure. Our next question is about residence. Uh, so it says, mm -hmm. when you say that residence is guaranteed for first time students, um, this means that first year students do not have to pay for residence. Is that the case? Oh. Well, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> but no, although the spot is guaranteed, you do still have to pay for residence. So that to that um, double traditional room, which is the the guaranteed room for all students who are eligible, starts at about twelve thousand Canadian dollars. So that'll include both the housing and your food. So not free, unfortunately, but guaranteed. So hopefully that clarifies for you. Hate to be the bearer of bad news. I know that would be so nice if residence was free for first <laughs> yeah. year. Um. So we don't have any other questions now. I did okay. see some typing, but <laughs> I'm not sure if it's uh, if it's coming in. So maybe we can wait, uh, you know, a few more seconds. And Absolutely. and then if if anyone else has any other questions, um, mm -hmm. we'll have some time at the end as well for us to ask Jessica more questions. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, OK. I'm not, yeah, I'm not seeing any other questions now. So maybe we can go ahead with the next part and then get back to questions at the end. Sure, that sounds good. And Emily, sorry, I do see one last question came in about oh, yeah. um, if a student applies and, and is accepted as an international student, but at some point in your education or in your application process, your status in Canada changes to a permanent resident or citizen, then Yes, yeah, so there's a process depending where you are in the process, whether you're still in the admissions phase or you are a registered student, but you would change your status on your record and then that would adjust your tuition fees. Um, so if you have any more particular questions about that and your situation, feel free to follow up with us. Happy to, to talk in more specifics. OK, so I spoke too soon earlier. We do have some more questions. <laughs> no, this is great. Um, our next question is um, for inter for an international student, what is the perfect time to apply for visa and immigration permits? So I'll, I'll speak to this in the next portion of my presentation, but the ideal time is as soon as possible. Um, there's no specific timeline. Um, and again, I'm going to speak to this, so I don't want to get ahead of myself, but basically as soon as you receive your offer of admission from Carleton, is the perfect time to be applying for your study permit. Awesome. And yes, you, Jess will cover all of that in the next part of this presentation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So another question, what are A-level provisional exam results? I think this is like a follow-up question to the earlier A-level question. Yeah, and so I'm not sure I quite understand, and this might have just been around the language we use about giving provisional or conditional, I should say, perhaps that clarifies a little bit, approval for that transfer credit or for advanced standing. So there aren't provisional exams. What we meant is that if you've indicated to us through your your unofficial transcripts that you are in the process of taking an A-level course, for example, then we would conditionally grant you that credit on the condition that you complete it upon graduation with the grade indicated to get that transfer. So I hope that clarifies. Uh, again, if you wanna follow up in any way, then we welcome you to do that. Awesome. Uh, so our next question is, 
Um, when will awards and bursary winners be admitted? Um, I'm not sure. I'll let you take it, but we might need sure. some clarification on the question. Sure. So as mentioned, if you are awarded an entrance scholarship, so one of our automatic entrance scholarships, which are available to students who are coming from high school, not for post-secondary transfer students, unfortunately. So if you are eligible and are awarded an entrance scholarship, that would have been indicated in your offer package, which you found in Carleton 360. If you applied for one of our entrance prestige scholarships, I believe those are going to be announced at the end of April, early May. Um, everyone will be who applied for a prestige scholarship will be notified one way or the other if they were successful. So um, that's still a few weeks away. Um, students who are incoming to Carleton unfortunately aren't eligible for bursaries. That would be something that you might consider looking at once you are already at Carleton as a registered student. So if I misunderstood your question or you need any further clarification, then please feel free to um, give us that in the chat box. Awesome. Thanks, Jess. Okay. Uh, so the next question is, if I get accepted and I got an offer letter from you, but my visa is not ready by September, what would happen to my application? Yeah, good question, because this this has happened on occasion in the last few years with some delayed processing times around COVID, for example. In this case, we just encourage you to keep in touch with Carleton and the admissions office to let us know about how your timeline is progressing. So if the start of classes is upon us and you still haven't received your study permit, then reach out to our office and we can talk about some, some options. And that might look like a deferral if that's possible, whether to January if your program allows for it or to the following September. But this is always evaluated case by case. So we'll look at you, your program, your timeline, and work together to find kind of a reasonable and fair outcome in that case. Um, but definitely stay in touch. We don't encourage you to arrive late. Uh, I know that's really tempting, but that's not something that we encourage. So rather get ahead of that. Okay, I'm going to take one more question and then we'll get on to the rest of the presentation. So yes, your there choice. are a lot. There are a lot of questions coming in, okay. um, but I think that a lot of them might be answered, you know, in the next part. So awesome. This last question for now is: um, as an international student, when does the foundation year start and the fees? Okay, this feels like a trick question. <laughs> so Carlton uh, doesn't have a foundation year. For admission purposes, we do require that students, in most cases, have 12 years of education already complete. So if you're coming from a country with 11 years, for example, then you would have to complete a year of post-secondary before applying to Carleton. I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to. Um, I could read this also to maybe talk about the English requirement. I don't know, Emily, how do you read it? Do you want to Yeah, I'm. I'm thinking... In? I think you answered it. I interpreted it the same as you. Um, okay. You know, we don't have a foundation year. You go directly into your program mm -hmm. um, that you applied to, uh, and the fees are due oh, yeah, right fees. before each semester. Um, so if you start your studies in September, the fees will be due on August 25th, and then the fees for the winter semester will be due on November 25th. Exactly. Great. Okay. Perfect. So I will go back to uh, sharing my screen. I recognize that we haven't hit all of the questions, but we will have a second Q&A period after uh, the study permit portion of my presentation. So thank you for your patience. And here we go. All right. So here we are transitioning to discuss study permits. So once you have your offer of admission from Carleton, you will need to submit your application for study permit. A study permit is a document that authorizes you, uh, an international student, to study in Canada. It is what allows you to stay and be in Canada legally. You will also need a travel visa. So that's a separate document. This is a document that allows you to physically enter Canada. There are two types of visas depending on what country issued your passport, but don't worry about knowing which one you need. 
your application for your study permit will automatically include the correct travel visa. So you do not need to apply for your travel visa separately. I should also note, I'm not sure if we do have any Americans in the session today, but Americans do not need a travel visa. So as I had spoken to a little bit in the Q&A portion, I want to stress that it is important, so important to start this process as soon as possible. It can take time to gather all of your documents and several weeks often for Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada, IRCC, to process applications. So do yourself that favor and get moving on your application as soon as possible. But before you start your application, you'll need to get all of your documents together. And that first document is your letter of acceptance from Carleton that we've been talking about. So in your acceptance package in Carleton 360, you'll also have a letter. The document is titled Student Information for Study Permit Letter. So a very obvious title to let you know what its intent is. So you'll need that. Second, you will need a valid passport. And it's best to make sure that you have a few years left on your passport before it expires because your study permit and travel visa cannot be granted beyond the expiration date of your passport. So number three, your financial documents. In the study permit application, you'll see a list of options that you can provide. So you don't need to submit all of the options, but the documents you do submit must demonstrate that you have the first year of tuition available and one year of living expenses to the minimum amount of $10,000. But it always works in your favor if you can demonstrate that you have access to more than the minimum of $10,000. So these documents, in addition to showing the funds, they must show that the money is available so that it's not tied up in long-term investments, say in real estate, for example, but that it's accessible and you can use it to pay your tuition. You also have to demonstrate that the money was obtained legally. So your documents should, should show the source of the money. So whether that's coming through regular paychecks that your parents receive or an inheritance, for example, show the source of the income. All of these documents will have to be uploaded digitally. So you'll wanna convert them to PDF if you can, and they must be in either English or French. So those are the main documents, but there are going to be additional requirements. If you haven't been to Canada before, you will likely need to submit biometrics. So this is a picture of your face and a copy of your fingerprints. IRCC will issue you a biometric instruction letter. So it's advised that you book as soon as possible, like everything, and your biometrics will be taken at a visa application center, so a VAC. All of this will be detailed in the biometrics instruction letter for you. So the next thing is depending where you've lived or recently traveled, you could be asked for a medical exam, the results of a medical exam. If you need a medical exam, IRCC will provide you again an instruction letter and a letter to take to your doctor. But on that note, all exams must be done by a doctor approved by IRCC not just your own family doctor, for example. And finally, visa offices in different countries could have different and additional requirements. So pay careful attention to all of the documents that are being requested on your application. So this could include something like a police certificate or results of a language test. They could ask for a study plan as well. And although a study plan isn't always required, it is something that Carlton suggests you always um, submit as well. It's a great idea and uh, can strengthen your application. I'm not going to go into detail about how to write a strong study plan in this presentation, but when we follow up from this presentation with additional resources via email, we will include some video that our International Student Services Office have created 
and they go into depth about how to write a strong study plan and how it can help improve your chances of an approved study permit. All right, so that's kind of all of the documents or the supplemental application when preparing for your study permit application. But the, the application itself will ask you a series of questions about your personal history. The questions will range on topics from your travel history, previous education, work, encounters with the law, and more. It is very important that you answer all of these questions truthfully. If you are found to have been dishonest, you could be banned from Canada for five years. So make sure that you read every question carefully so that you aren't misrepresenting yourself. And if you feel like an answer to a question, the yes or no binary just isn't enough and you need to add a story, that's fine. You can include a letter of explanation. So whether it's a letter of explanation or a study plan, if you're including any additional documents that don't have their own line item for upload, you can use the client information or additional information lines to upload those documents. Okay, so this is a lot. I recognize that. Um, and it's just been a very kind of high level overview about preparing your study permit application. But some of you might be considering hiring someone to help you with your study permit application. You do not have to use a representative. You can absolutely prepare to do this yourself. But if you choose to use a representative, I just wanted to share a couple of tips to make sure that you are um, not exposing yourself to fraud. So number one, make sure that you're using an authorized rep. Nobody legally can collect a fee to help you with your study permit application unless they are authorized. So there are three groups of people who are authorized. The first are lawyers and paralegals who are members in good standing of a Canadian provincial or territorial law society. Number two, are notaries who are members in good standing of the, and excuse my French, Chambre de Notaire de Quebec. And number three, citizenship or immigration consultants who are members in good standing of the College of Immigration and Citizenship Consultants. So again, only those three groups can collect fees from you. If you choose to use a representative, you will need to give IRCC written consent. There's a representative form that you can submit so that they can share your information with the representative. So a few other tips for protecting yourself. Be careful of anything that sounds too good to be true. So as soon as someone says to you, I guarantee your study permit will be approved, immediate red flag. Nobody can guarantee that. Be aware of representatives that encourage you to lie or to stretch the truth on your application. Remember, if you misrepresent yourself, you are responsible, not the representative or the person who encouraged you to lie. And that could cause you to be banned from Canada for five years. So that is another red flag. Don't sign any blank forms. Make sure you get copies of everything and have access to your own account and documents. And if you pay for anything, get a signed receipt. So the email there on the bottom of the slide, isso at carlton.ca. I've mentioned them a few times, but our International Student Services Office, they do have folks who are legally able to support students with their study permit applications and questions around immigration. So if you have any very specific questions to your process, I encourage you to email them directly and they'll be able to offer you some support. So again, isso at carlton.ca and speak to some of our very knowledgeable immigration advisors in that office. Okay, so once all of that is done, then you will be ready to come to Ottawa and join our wonderful community here in Ottawa and at Carleton. 
Okay, so I think this is a, another great point to pause and look back at some of the questions that you've asked and perhaps you have new questions um, based on what you've seen in my last few slides. So I invite you now to ask your questions. I'll stop sharing the screen so you can see our lovely faces. Awesome. Okay. okay thanks, Jet. Ooh, go for it, so, Emily. We have two questions so far, and I I expect my uh, some more might come in. Um, right. The first one is: if the funds are not available, does Carlton offer any help to international students? Mm -hmm. Great question. So, unfortunately, other than the entrance scholarships that we've already discussed, there's no additional additional funds or support available for students to meet their financial requirements for their study permit. So I also just want to clarify too, the requirement for proof of funds is completely separate from Carleton. You're not demonstrating that you have the funds to Carleton, but that's for your eligibility for your study permit approval by the government and IRCC. So unfortunately, no additional support from Carleton. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what is a study plan? Sure, I'll give you a brief introduction to what a study plan is, but then I do encourage you when we follow up with additional resources to watch the video created by ISSO. But essentially a study plan is outlining for the person who will be evaluating your application, why you want to study in Canada, why you chose the program that you chose, is there a specific reason that you aren't studying in your home country, especially if that program does exist there in your home country. How will this program at Carleton support your career aspirations? Um, you know, just thinking about any questions that your officer might have um, and answering them proactively. So you want to think about demonstrating um, to your officer that you have connections back home and that you want to take what you've learned back to a career in your home country to demonstrate that you will in fact leave Canada uh, when it's time if you don't have the appropriate pathways to staying. So um, it's quite a bit more nuanced but that's just kind of an introduction to what a study plan is. Thank you. Um, so the next question here and I can help you answer it if you need help. Um, sure. How much are the fees for economics? Oh, have you already um, looked up the... <laughs> I have looked it up. I have looked it up and I'm going to put it in the chat so that the number sure. is here. Um, the okay. fees for economics are approximately um, $30,000 per year. They're a little bit more than $30,000, but that's the approximate amount. amount. And I'm going to put it in the chat so that it's here in writing as well. Yeah. And um, I'll just speak, sorry, Emily, mm -hmm. I'll just speak to tuition a little bit because I know a lot of people are wondering as you're trying to just get your finances in order and demonstrating to IRCC that you have that first year of tuition saved. So we do have a link on our website and I think Emily can also share the broader link um, because Tuition does range depending on program from about 30,000 to 46,000. What we have posted on our website now is the 2022-23 tuition fees. So those will be slightly increased for the 2023-24 year. So just be prepared for that, but do keep a watch. We expect that those will be updated in the next um, couple of months. So if you have any more specific questions as you're preparing um, around your tuition, please feel free to reach out. And I did just put the link in the chat for everyone so you can see exactly what the tuition fees are for the program that you will be studying. Wonderful. Okay, so next question. Um, does the university have to see the study permit as well? Uh, or where would I have to upload that document? So you don't have to um, send your study permit to Carleton. We don't collect that. But so the way I should have, I didn't mention basically how you actually obtain your study permit. So if you're approved for your study permit, what you're granted is a letter of introduction from IRCC. So that's not your actual study permit. You'll take that letter of introduction with you to the border, to customs, when you land in Canada or however you're arriving, and show that to the CBSA officer. And then they will review everything and issue you your actual physical study permit so you won't be able to enter Canada 
you know, if that all doesn't go to plan between your visa and your study permit. Um, so nothing further to do in terms of demonstrating or proving to Carlton that you were successful. But I also want to add that we do participate twice a year in kind of like an audit for IRCC. So they are checking in when with the, the international students that we have registered at Carleton against who they have on their list of students who indicated that they have a study permit attached to Carleton. So there is some due diligence there um, with some reporting that happens twice a year between all of the universities in Canada and IRCC. Awesome, thank you. Next question. Um, someone has said, I've started my application process, but I don't understand what the use of family representative document is asking for. So I, you don't necessarily have to fill that out. I, I'm going to ask that you follow up this question in an email to me, um, Jessica Morrow at carlton.ca. Uh, Emily can pop that in the chat, but I have a slide on it as well, so you can you can catch it later um, and we can look at it together. But if you're not using a representative, then that might be a form you don't have to fill out um, that anytime you fill out a form about a representative, essentially you are giving them access and the ability to access the information that you've submitted to IRCC and that IRCC is sharing with you. So be thoughtful about that for sure. Okay, perfect. And I did. Okay. Oh, awesome. Two of us just put Jess, uh, Jessica's email in the chat. Great. Um, so you won't miss it. Okay. So let me just see. Sorry, I lost my spot. So I'm just trying to That's scroll okay. up and see. We have lots of questions. Okay. So the next one is um, not related to a study permit, but it is, are we allowed to pay in parts as first year students? So I think like in installments is mm -hmm. what the question Yeah. Means. So you can pay by term. So I think Emily actually referenced this earlier. So you can pay by term. August 25th would be the deadline to pay for the fall term. And then November 25th is a deadline to pay for the winter term. And if you do choose to study during the summer, some do, but it's also considered a scheduled break, then there would be a third payment option as well. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, but sorry, I just want to also stress, sorry, Emily, that when you do demonstrate funds to IRCC, that you are demonstrating you have funds for the full year, for, for the at least those two terms of September to April. So even if you choose to pay in installments, you still have to have those funds available. Awesome. Good to know. OK, so sorry, I think I... <laughs> Lots of questions are coming in. OK, so next one for financial documents um, in the study permit. What are the ways we can demonstrate the funds? So this will be outlined for you more specifically within the application. So have a look at that because um, I don't want to go through an exhaustive list here. A common way is just bank statements. So if you have um, if it's one of your parents that will be funding you or a sponsor, they can submit bank statements where you can clearly see that the money is available in cash and where the money came from. So the source, um, if you do receive a scholarship, then you can also include the scholarship letter as part of your financial documents as well to demonstrate that um, that that will be contributing to how you pay your tuition. So there's, again, just review the list that's list that is included in the application package. Perfect. Um, next question is not necessarily about study permits. It is if you have more than three years of studying in English, do they do we need to sit for the English proficiency test um, or would we waive it? So generally speaking, if you do have three years of education exclusively in English, then you have met the English requirement. But I hesitate to say that this is a blanketed rule because it will depend sometimes a little bit on what school you were studying at and what country you're applying for. So every student in this situation would be evaluated case by case. So your admissions officer will look at your specific file. If you see that you've been asked for proof of English language proficiency via a English test, for example, and you feel confident that you have that three years, feel free to send us an email and we can always have a closer look to see if that's a hold that we can remove. 
So sorry, not a very black and white answer, um, but definitely feel free to follow up if you feel like you're very confident in that. We can have a look. Perfect. And the next question is actually also related to English. But you know what? Sure. I'm actually going to ask the student to clarify. Um, okay. It's so I think I don't want to mispronounce your name and I'm sorry if I do, but uh, Nadirat, um, do you mind just clarifying your, your question? It says, at what point does Carleton University for the English proficiency test? So can you just clarify what you mean by that? Um, and we can come back to that once you have put in the chat. Sure. So the next question is, have you have you already sent admission to applicant as to apply one must have acceptance letter from you? Um, I might ask for more clarification on that question as well. Um, have you have you already sent admission? So I think maybe the question is, have we already sent out offers? Mm -hmm. um, maybe so, you want to answer that? Sure. So decisions on your applications happen on a rolling basis. So we've been making decisions as applications have been made complete and ready for review. So as I mentioned, decisions are taking roughly four to six weeks from when your application was complete. So many people have already received an offer um, or a decision and we're continuing to make offers every hour of every day. <laughs> Not every hour, but um, most hours of every day. So offers are continuing to be made, absolutely. Perfect, thank you. Um, so next question is, I have two passports and the names are slightly different. Is that something accepted by you because I'm transferring from post-secondary with one passport and I applied to Carleton with the other? Hmm, this might be a question worth following up on with us. Um, I wasn't, we don't typically, as far as I know, and Emily, correct me, um, require or collect passports from students. So I don't think that that actually would be something that would be a barrier that you use one pass, that you chose to submit a passport to, to Carleton. It's not something that we require. Um, so what is most important is that everything lines up with your study permit application and matches your passport there. I suppose what might be an issue is if the name that's written on your offer letter, on your study permit information letter, doesn't align with the passport you're applying for your study permit, that could be an issue. So if that's the case, please reach out to us and that's an adjustment that we can make in your offer package so that it aligns with what you need for your study permit. So I hope we understood that. If not, follow up directly and we can get more clarity. Awesome. Still lots of questions. So the next one. Okay, good. I have a bit of stamina left. <laughs> Go for it. So the next question is uh, for international students who have English as a second language. Mm -hmm. I think the question is asking, do they have to study a program? Um, and I'm assuming okay. that is referring to like uh, to taking ESL courses. Sure. So we, yeah, actually, this is a great question because it's not something that we mentioned in terms of your admission package. So we do have certain levels that a student must meet for direct admission into their program. So for example, to use the IELTS, 6.5 with no section below six. So if you reached our threshold, then you were admitted with no English condition. If you tested below our threshold, you may have still been admitted into your program, but with an English requirement. So this would have been detailed in your offer package. Another reason to read it very carefully, but that would require you to take English classes in your first year. So the class that you'll have to take will depend on where you tested on your testing results. If any time between now and when you start classes, you retest, say you take another IELTS or TOEFL or whichever exam and you test higher, you can resubmit that in your application. You'll likely have to email it to us and we can look at that English requirement that was initially attached to your offer of admission. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, if you need any more clarity, then probably best to email us directly if you're unsure what that condition meant in your package. 
Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So next question is my passport expires next year and I've already applied for the study visa. Would this mean I have to apply again for my new passport? Yeah, so likely what it'll mean is that you'll have to apply, that your study permit will likely only be granted to the expiration date of your passport. So you might only get a one-year study permit. So you'll have to apply for a study permit extension once you get your new passport. I know this timeline can sound a little bit complicated or a bit overwhelming, so it might be good a good idea to just touch base with our International Student Services Office. One of the immigration advisors there can help you conceptualize that timeline for your study permit extension. Um, yeah, so definitely something that you will want to act on very quickly so that you make sure you maintain status while you are studying. Perfect. Okay, we have four more questions. I think we okay, can do it. Okay, I think we can do it. Um, so the next question may require follow-up um, okay. or some more time. Um, sure. Just someone has said that they didn't clearly, they didn't get clearly on the first steps of applying for a study permit. Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll let you take that. <laughs> sure, so just a reminder, we are going to follow up from this session in an email with some additional resources, which are gonna include a series of four videos um, that kind of details the study permit application process. So in much more depth than I was able to go in today. But essentially, if you go onto the IRCC website and you will see an option to apply, you'll indicate like, what are you applying for? I wanna study. And it really does prompt you uh, to go through the steps fairly intuitively. So that's the first step, basically, once you have your offer of admission from Carleton. But uh, if you have any questions after going onto the IRCC website, definitely follow up. Awesome. Okay, so next question. Um, must students pay a fixed amount of tuition fees every term? What if students finish all the courses early, for example, in three and a half years? So you're only paying tuition for the terms in which you're studying. Yeah, nice. anything to add, um, Emily? <laughs> no, I think that's perfect. Yeah, if, you if you finish your degree in three and a half years, you are only paying for three and a half years. You're paying for the two, the semesters that you are studying for. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, next question. Um, okay, so this is the clarification on the English question earlier. Okay. Um, at what point does Carleton University ask for the English proficiency test? Sure, so that we ask for that pretty early on in your application process. So that's one of the required documents we need in order to review your application. So your application wouldn't have been reviewed until we get proof of English language proficiency, if it's required. So again, this is why it's important to look at your Carleton 360 account, look at your checklist, and if we are asking for proof of English language proficiency, to upload it there because we cannot evaluate your application until we see that in addition to the other documents we're asking for. So pretty much right away. Awesome. Now this is the last question we have. Okay. So hey, great. We made it. Make it a good um, in my applic in my applicant portal there is a required requirement required document labeled as semester two courses. Can mm -hmm. I prepare a, the list of courses I am taking by myself or do I need to take the list from my school? So although it can be an unofficial document at this point, it is best if you have something from the school but it could be say downloaded from a school portal if it's just like a pdf document it's not something that you can just type up in word or excel yourself so if you can get an unofficial document from your school or if you have access to like a student portal that has your grades that's some that's what we'd expect i'd say um in that case so if you need any clarification about like what that looks like again please get in touch but i suspect it's something that your school counselor is familiar with if you ask them okay sorry we do have one more question now that just came in okay um, and, and i sure, will i can i can provide a link for this question um sure. what are the financial aid opportunities available for international students sure so yeah emily's going to drop a link but as an incoming student other than the entrance scholarships that we've already spoken to, there aren't really any additional financial aid opportunities. International students 
aren't eligible, unfortunately, for provincial or federal student loans. There are going to be additional scholarship opportunities once you are a student registered at Carleton, but that's not something you would be looking at at least for another year. So you really do, other than those entrance scholarships, which are a fraction of the total tuition cost, have to come up with those funds yourself. Awesome. Okay. And this has brought us to the end. Thanks, Jess. Yeah, no problem. So before any of you uh, leave, we do have a few reminders of some exciting and really helpful events that are coming up over the next couple of months. So let me go back to sharing my screen. So stick around for a few more minutes. And here we go. So of course, we've mentioned a couple of times, if you don't have my email address yet, it's jessicamorrow at carlton.ca. We also have an international inbox that all of us are monitoring that is international at carlton.ca. So you have two choices there how you want to get in touch. All right, so these are our upcoming events that will cover all the various topics that are top of mind for you. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah. I'm coming to you from Carlton's Greenhouses. On behalf of the International Admissions team, we are so excited to invite you to our Your Life at Carlton 2023 Open House for International Applicants. We've got two sessions. The first one is at 6 a.m. and the second one is at 1 p.m. local Ottawa time. You can join us from anywhere around the world and get to choose whichever session you want that matches and works best with your time zone. During the open house, our team and some of our current international students are going to discuss some topics such as academic life, uh, living on campus and living in Ottawa. We're also going to talk about employability and job opportunities and of course, your opportunities in getting engaged and involved and making an impact. Uh, of course, you two are going to get the chance to ask all of your questions during the students panel and during live chat. Uh, we hope you can make it. Okay, so hopefully that came through Hi, okay. So absolutely watch for information about our open house. That'll be a great opportunity to continue to learn more and prepare. So more specifically for your questions around immigration, our Office of International Student Services will be running a couple of sessions in April called Ask an Advisor. So if you are starting your application collect your questions and bring them to these sessions. These folks are truly the experts. They're doing immigration advising every day. So take a shot of that QR code and register for one of those events. There is also an event section on their website, on the ISSO website. So if they, and they will continue to have additional Q and A's that will be themed differently over the coming months. So watch the ISSO page as well. And then our office will be running three reading and accepting your offer presentations um, through April and May. So I, I dipped my toe, let's say, in that information today, but these sessions will go into much more depth about what you need to be considering when reading your offer of admission and hopefully accepting that offer. So make sure that you grab those QR codes because those will be really helpful sessions. Okay, so that, my friends, is it. That is all of the content for today's Ask Us Anything. We thank you so much for joining us today, whatever time it is, wherever you are in the world. And we cannot wait to welcome you to Carleton in September. So thank you again, and please feel free to go on with your day and get in touch. Happy to continue to answer your questions. Bye.
Great job. It's only us now. Oh, I should stop recording.